Hi, this is uh, lecture two of ET250. Uh, today we're going to be talking about independent voltage sources and current sources. Uh, we're going to talk about these two fundamental laws, Kirchhoff's voltage law and Kirchhoff's current law, uh, power and then dependent sources opposed, as opposed to independent sources. All right, so let's start off with independent voltage sources. Okay. All right, so it's a, the, the formal definition, it's a circuit element that maintains a constant voltage independent of current, right? Uh, we have to make sure, just like when you're assigning a voltage, uh, voltage source or a voltage uh, a reference, that the polarity matters, right? You got to get that plus and minus correct, all right? And the circuit symbol uh, that you might come across looks like this, right? A circle with a plus or minus or uh, these kind of long and short lines. And if you look carefully, you can see that this long line represents the positive terminal, right? So either one um, represents an independent voltage source. Notice there's usually multiple of these lines and don't confuse this with the capacitor that you'll see later on where it's just two parallel plates, all right? Uh, the easiest way to think of a voltage source in terms of physical applications are battery, right? Um, a battery, you know, like a typical 12 volt battery coming out of a vehicle, uh, you have the plus or minus. Well, that's equivalent to this symbol, right? Okay. Now a plot for it, if I were to plot current versus voltage, would be something that look like, looks like this. Doesn't matter what current is coming or being drawn off of it, uh, you would have a constant voltage. In this case, this would be 12, right? Now, you cannot use Ohm's law for this. V equals plus or minus IR, uh-uh. You cannot use it for an independent voltage source. It's tempting, right? You have maybe some voltage, you, may, you might have some current, but what would be the resistance? No. Okay, now the other thing I, I point out is this is an idealized kind of situation here. This is kind of an engineering model that we use. Now, obviously, if you're pulling a lot of current out of this, a real device like this battery, you're not going to get constant voltage. But for the sake of uh, some of these toy problems, yes, we will make this assumption, okay? But I think you guys can understand that this isn't going to always be the case at infinite currents, all right? Okay. An independent current source, and like I said in the previous lecture, you're going to see a lot of this dual capacitors, inductors, voltage sources, current sources. They're going to be very similar, but kind of the opposite. All right, so independent current source. An uh, independent current source is a circuit element that maintains constant current independent of voltage, kind of the dual of this, right? And like the voltage source, the polarity matters. Well, in a current source, the arrow direction matters, right? And the circuit symbol for an independent current source is this guy. So note the similarities, right? right? You have a circle here, a circle here, and then instead of a plus and minus, you have an arrow, all right? Um, one example of an independent current source would be like a welder. Um, we brought up the welding example in the last lecture. Um, in a welding example, you set a constant current and it tries to maintain that constant current when you're welding, okay? And so this would be an example of a plot for a constant current source. Notice I flipped the axis here. Current is on the X, your voltage is on the X. So it doesn't matter what the voltage is, the current is constant. Now again, that's not always gonna be true in a physical system, right? How do you maintain you know, constant current no matter what the voltage is? Impossible, right? But this is, you know, again, our mathematical model that we're trying uh, just to simplify our system, right? Again, I repeat, can't use Ohm's law. This is a common issue that a lot of students have used. Ohm's law for these things. No, 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 no. Please don't do that. All right, let's keep going. All right, so Kirchhoff's voltage law. That's the next fundamental thing. So Ohm's law, the resistor equation, KVL, uh, these are some of the laws that you're just going to have to memorize and know how to use. Okay, so the sum of voltages around a loop equals zero, all right? And so we can write that mathematically as this. This is the sigma summation symbol, uh, sum of V equals zero, but that doesn't really mean a lot uh, to anyone, actually, until you see what we're talking about when we mean loop and um, voltages. What is this? Okay, so here's a simple system, right? You have a bunch of elements. I, I'm not even labeling. They could be resistors, voltage sources, whatever, but let's say you've measured their voltages, right? And so the question might be here, what is this voltage 
given these voltages here, and we can use this KVL Kirchhoff's voltage law to figure that out. And when I see this, this is equivalent to saying, I have my multimeter here, right? So here's my multimeter, and I have my red and black leads, okay? And so let's say in my uh, measurements, I went, okay, I measure with the red lead here at the positive terminal minus, I saw a positive five volts, I saw a positive eight volts, I saw red minus a uh, positive nine volts, right? Now they could have been negative, but uh, this is the situation, right? Okay. Um, what we can do is apply this rule KVL and see what this unknown voltage is, right? And so what I, what you can do is let's, it doesn't matter which direction you do in terms of uh, the arrow. I, ha I just drew an arrow to help myself, right? But let's say I go around here and I go, well, every time I hit an element and if I see the positive or negative, right, that's what uh, uh, polarity I'm going to put first. So in this case, I see positive first. So I put positive V e, plus five volts. So I put plus five plus eight volts plus eight plus nine volts plus nine equals zero. So this left side is the summation side and this right side equals zero. All right. Now I have one equation, one known. I can solve it. I can bring everything to the right. And I see that V equals minus 22 volts, right? And let's check, does that make intuitive sense? If I have minus to plus, minus to plus, minus to plus, that's like stacking a bunch of batteries, right? All the way up here. So I have 22 volts from here relative to there. But notice the polarity of this, I put the minus there. So I know I have a higher voltage of 22 up here relative to this point, but because I'm kind of measuring it backwards, I'm gonna get a negative value and that's what we see here. So this is good, this is good. All right, here's another subtle little example that does cause a lot of confusion with, with students. Here's a very simple case where you wanna apply KVL. Now, even before we apply KVL, we probably could intuit what this voltage is. I have a battery or a voltage source, independent voltage source, I have a resistor, and I have this V, this voltage, and I have plus and minus, right? And I could see, oh, I got the plus, plus, minus, yeah, that's gonna be 12 volts, the 12 volts across this resistor, okay? Now let's take our formalism that of uh, the KVL and see if we get the same result. All right, so what do we have here? I'm gonna go around this loop. Again, it doesn't matter the arrow. If I went around the other way, I'd get the same answer. But let's go. I see a minus 12 here, good. I see a positive V here, good. And I go minus 12 plus V equals zero. That's to finish off that summation. I go, okay, bring the 12 to the other, or minus 12 to the other side. I get V equals positive 12. Good, that matches the intuition that we had before, right? So hopefully this kind of locks in a little bit more how to use this KVL. All right, let's do another example. Okay, so this example is what is the V and the I? So this is gonna bring in our Ohm's law, okay? Now, like I said, you cannot apply Ohm's law to voltage sources. You can only apply it to the resistors, right? So we would wanna write the Ohm's law for this, but to find this V, we want to use this 12. Now, it looks like this system and this system are pretty much the same, right? We have the same polarity, same polarity, good, right? So I bet you this is gonna be 12 volts, right? And then we'll apply Ohm's law. Okay, now, even before we analyze the problem, if I've set up this current arrow in this direction or the problem sets it up in this direction, it looks like if I were to connect this resistor to this battery, current will probably flow this way I bet this current will probably be a negative number. All right, so let's do the problem and see if that matches our intuition. Okay, again, KVL minus 12 plus V minus 12 plus V equals zero, good. That's the same thing we did here. So we get 12, good. And then we say Ohm's law, V equals minus IR. And well, remember, we don't apply Ohm's law to this guy, we apply only to the resistor. So V equals plus or minus IR, and we go, okay, what is the current arrow doing relative to the polarity? So with Ohm's law, you need both the current direction and the polarity. And I see that this arrow is entering before it hits the element, the negative terminal. So I'm gonna use the negative version of Ohm's law, good? And I wanna solve for I, I equals minus V over R in this case, and I can now plug in the numbers. 12 goes in here, 10 goes in here, and I get minus 1.2 amps, yay. So that tells me that my intuition was correct in that the current is flowing top to bottom through this resistor. Good, 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 good.
Okay. Now, another thing I wanted to point out is, um, let's say I had this 12 volt, right? And there's really three other configurations of this system that would work. So let's see, I could keep the plus or minus V and then I could flip the current direction, right? I could now do this, flip the voltage, and I could do this and this for the current direction. These are the four different combinations of either flipping the polarity or flipping the current direction for this system, right? Now here's the thing, in all cases, these should behave the same way. I should get current going this way and I should get high, a higher voltage of 12 volts up here relative to here, right? In these two cases, can you imagine if I use KVL, I would get V equals minus 12 volts and we could do it formally, minus 12, minus V equals zero, if you guys see that. So therefore, V equals minus 12. And I can get the same thing here. All right, that's fine. I could also go and head and then apply Ohm's law to this, right? In this version here, I better get current as positive. In this version here, I better get current as positive. In this version here, I, we showed it got negative. And in this version here, we show that it gets negative. All right, why don't we do it? Let's do all four of these examples. We already got this one, right? We know that this is positive 12 volts and we know this is negative 1.2 amps. Let's see if this comes out to positive 1.2 amps. Let's see if this comes out to positive 1.2 amps and let's see if this comes out to negative 1.2 amps, right? And what I wanna show you by doing all four of these slowly is that it doesn't matter what polarities and current directions that are assigned here, as long as the system is physically the same, it's that the math will work itself out as long as you are consistent with the rules, okay? So let's do this first one here, all right. So we know here by KVL, notice I'm writing the laws being good, V equals positive 12 volts, yay, okay? So then we go by Ohm's law, V equals, and I see current going to the positive term of positive IR, okay, good. So then I equals V over R, I is equal to positive 12 over 10 amps. Yay, okay, so that's flowing in this direction. So consistent with our intuition. Okay, let's do this one. So in this case here, what do we have? We have V equals minus 12 in both of these cases. And now we can say Ohm's law. We go, okay, I is entering the negative terminal. V equals minus IR, is that right? And so I equals minus V over R, good. But check this out, I equals minus, I gotta be, Careful, I'm putting my little parentheses here because the voltage is negative, 12 over 10. Notice the negatives cancel and I still ends up being a positive number. So even though the voltage, we flipped the polarity, but we kept the same current direction and because these are equivalent systems, look how the I and the I still have the same sign. The arrows in left to right, positive, okay? In this one, I better see that the current is negative, right? So let's again do this. So we have Ohm's law here, V equals, let's see what's going on, entering the positive terminal, positive IR, good. I equals positive V over R, so I is equal to, where's V? V is still this minus 12 over 10, ah, 10 amps. Good, I'm getting a negative number for this version. Again, I repeat, all four of these systems are the same physical system. There's no change. I better get overall current flowing from top to bottom. In these two cases, uh, sorry, in uh, these two cases, I see that this number becomes negative, right? In these two cases, I see that this current becomes positive. Good. So I hope that shows that just be consistent with the rules will get you the right behavior, the consistent behavior, okay? All right, let's keep moving on. So the next one is Kirchhoff's current law. And again, the dual is gonna be very, it's very similar to Kirchhoff's voltage law, except for its currents. So the sum of the currents entering and exiting a node equals zero. Okay, so it's written by the similar equation, the summation sum i equals zero, okay. Um, 
Another way to think of it, and I actually like to think of it this way, is the currents entering or leaving a node equals the, uh, they equal each other, right? And so you can write it like this, sum of the currents entering equals the sum of the currents leaving. These are equivalent, okay? And then first we gotta figure out, well, what's a node? Well, a node is any junction where uh, conductors meet, right? Okay, and so you can see here that you have all these wires meeting. This is a node right here. In fact, even if you had one wire, right? Even if you had one wire, you could pick any point on there as a node, right? And this actually comes up. I mean, it's, it's a kind of a weird kind of nuanced case, but you can imagine here, if I had a current going in and a current going up, they're gonna be the same current, but opposite in sign, right? Now I can apply, let's do the KCL on this smaller one first, okay? So sum of the currents entering the nodes equals the sum of currents leaving. So let's look at this. I have six amps entering, I entering, so that I'll put on the left side, nothing leaving, so that equals zero. So solving for this, I equals negative six. If I look at this one, sum of the currents entering and leaving equals zero. So in kind of a similar situation, all of them are leaving. So I can say five plus I plus negative three. Five plus I plus negative three equals zero because nothing enters. And if I solve for I, if I bring these guys over, I get negative two, right? So again, another way to solve for some unknown currents, right? Um, let's see if we can do some examples with this. So let's look at this example here. All right, let's analyze what we got. We have two independent current sources. We have a resistor and they gave us the information that the resistor has a, a value of one ohm. Uh, and we have a voltage and current assigned, all right? And the question is, please find I and V, all right? So we can figure out how would we do this? How would we approach this? If it seems like if I know V, I could use Ohm's law to get I because I have the R and vice versa. So once I find one of these I or V's, I'm done. Is that right? Okay. It looks like I know what the current is in this branch and it looks like I know what the current is in this branch, but this is unknown. So I think I can apply my new friend KCL. Okay. So if I look at the top node, here's my node here and some of the currents entering equals some of the currents leaving. So I can see, well, I have three amps entering, two amps entering, and actually this I also enters. So I'm gonna put all that on the left side. Two plus I plus three equals zero. I'm gonna solve for I and uh, I'm gonna get a negative number, right? If all these currents are entering, this current overall better be leaving, so that's gonna be a negative number. And sure enough, I get negative five amps. Again, we apply Ohm's law. And notice Ohm's law is gonna come up over and over and over, ladies and gentlemen. So V equals minus IR. And again, why is that? Because we have I and before it hits the element, it's gonna hit that negative terminal. So V equals minus IR, boom. I know I, I know R, I can solve for V minus, we've got to be very careful. Notice I put the parentheses, minus, minus five times one V, we're good. V equals positive five volts. And that should make sense. If I have current flowing down through here, that must mean there was positive pressure here that's enabling this uh, current to flow down. I better get a higher voltage up here. So again, I always recommend after you're done with the problem, don't just stop, uh, or sorry, don't just move on. I recommend you stop and reflect on the problem and go, Does the, do these numbers make sense before you continue? And you'll build intuition. Okay, let's keep going. All right, the next topic is power. Man, this is power is so fundamental to engineering. You really have to get a good grasp on power. And so just like in electrical systems, we also have expressions for power. And what is power? The power is the ability to absorb or deliver energy, right? And like I said before, we, you know, we went over this in the first lecture, we have the physical quantity power, power, the symbol is P, the unit is a watt, and the symbol is W. I like to put the hard brackets there to denote the symbol of the unit. We know because power is related to energy by the calculus term, the derivative, and it's the time rate of change of energy. So joule, which is energy per time or second, joule per second is a watt. That's just the definition of a watt. And so power is energy per time, no problem. And again, we think of energy, velocity is meters per second, uh, current is coulombs or charge per second, and power is joules per second or energy uh, per second, energy per time, right? Okay, so great. 
some common values for power, common values. One horsepower, we went over this last time actually, one horsepower, 745 watts about, all right? A scooter, a uh, simple like moped is like about five horsepower, so 3.7 kilowatts. Uh, a Bugatti Veyron is a thousand horsepower. That's what they claim. It's a 745 kilowatts, right? You're just using that, you know, multiplied by a thousand. And a 747 airplane, 50 capital M, not lowercase m, capital M is mega, 10 to the six million watts, megawatts. And our um, near and dear to our hearts, the Golden Bear twin diesel engine thumper and Bambi, they put out 17,000 horsepower or 12.7 megawatts. Yes, yeah, solid. Solid, solid. Okay, we are going to go over pow the power equation. And when we write the power equation, it's actually going to look very similar to Ohm's law. We're going to have that plus or minus. P equals plus or minus IV. All right. Um, and the reason why we have the plus or minus is so that we know if the power, uh, uh, the circuit element that we're looking at, is it absorbing power or is it delivering power? So we are always computing the power from the perspective of absorbing. So if you get a positive number, that means your element absorbed power. If you get a negative number, that means your element delivered power. So we're always in the perspective of power absorbed. That's why I wrote this, okay? And the rules for plus and minus follow the same exact passive sign convention for Ohm's law. So that's nice. You don't have to memorize another thing. Okay. So let's look at the positive version. So let's say we have an element just like an Ohm's law. The current enters, uh, before it enters the element, it hits the positive terminal of the voltage. Then we use the positive value P or the positive version of, of power P equals plus IV. All right. And then if we see that the current hits the negative terminal before it enters the element, like in this case, then we use the negative or P equals minus IV. And remember, current is like a flow, like a velocity. V is like a pressure, like a force. Remember for mechanical dynamical system, P equals torque times omega, P equals force times velocity. This is like your force, this is like your velocity, right? If I get large values of both, then I have something that's highly powerful. If I only have voltage or I only have current, it's maybe not as powerful as something where if you have a lot of current and a lot of voltage, okay? And just to reiterate, if power is positive, the number I calculate is positive, the element absorbing power. If the number ends up being negative, the element is delivering power, okay? Or you could think of it as absorbing negative power, okay? All right, let's do a few examples to really hit this home. So let's say we have, let me do this. Let's say we have a circuit element and we've measured 10 volts across it, okay? So I've ha I have my multimeter here and I went, okay, I can measure 10 volts. And, and you're gonna do this in the lab and you're gonna measure current and you're gonna measure, let's say five amps. And remember, how do you measure current? Just to reiterate, you would have to take your multimeter, put this on the current setting, right? Break the circuit and put it in series, right? To measure your current, because remember current is through and voltage is across, okay? And let's say those two numbers I got were five amps and 10 volts. I could use my power equation and I got to pick which one. Do I use positive or negative? Well, looks like the current is going to the positive terminal. Okay, looks like I can use the positive version. So P equals plus IV and I just punch in the numbers. Okay, five times 10, 50 watts. So what this is saying is this element, this resistor is absorbing 50 watts. Now the nice thing about power is you can use it for any circuit element. It doesn't have to be restricted to just resistors. It could be voltage sources, independent and dependent voltage sources. It could be capacitors, inductors. If you know the voltage and current, you can compute the power absorbed or delivered in that circuit element. So that's nice. It's not as restrictive as Ohm's law. All right, let's do another one. Let's say we have this system, right? We have a resistor here. We've measured 10 volts, but notice we have current going up at negative three amps. Hmm. Current going up at negative three amps is equivalent to current going down at positive three amps. I think that's probably gonna be absorbing power. I bet you that that's gonna be positive 30 watts, but let's calculate it, okay. And what I'm, I'm not gonna change any of the signs or the arrows or anything. I'm just gonna follow the formalism that we have to blindly just compute and see if that matched our intuition. So I can see that if I don't, 
ignore the numbers, just look at the arrow and the polarity. The current is entering, before it enters, it hits the negative. So it sees, I, I put the negative version of, of the power. And now I just fill in the numbers and I gotta be careful, this I has the negative three. So I have P equals negative, negative three times 10. Oh, good, negative, negative cancel and I get 30 watts as my intuition stated, right? So this is good, all right, let's do another one. Um, let's see. Four resistors, yes, yes. Four resistors, power absorbed must be positive, right? And I always joke, if you can design a resistor that, uh, that is able to generate negative power, you let me know, you let me know. And if, if we'll check your calculations and you will check your physical device and if it actually produces negative power, don't tell anyone else, just tell me and hopefully we can make a lot of money. But most likely you probably made a mistake. Okay, all right, so usually resistors generate positive power in, in that they always are absorbing. Okay, um, here's another example. Let's say you had some random circuit element, you don't know what it is, but you were able to measure the current and voltage, right? And so these were arbitrarily assigned voltage and current directions and voltage polarities, and we can now just follow the rules. So in this case, it looks like it's, we're gonna use the positive version of the power because the current's going in the positive, so P equals plus IV. And it looks like we're gonna punch in these uh, numbers. So it looks like I'm gonna get a negative number of negative 15 watts, right? And that means that this is absorbing negative 15 or it's delivering positive 15 watts. That's an equivalent statement, okay? A lot of circuits is bookkeeping, to be honest, right? You have um, just getting those signs right. And if you're very good at that bookkeeping, it's going to go a long ways. All right. Hello, I wanted to make a small correction from the previous video. Um, and I talk about this power conservation. What you can do is you can actually compute the power absorbed for every element in a circuit. And there's gonna be positive and negative terms. The positive terms will correspond to power elements that absorb power and the negative terms will correspond to elements that deliver power. Uh, in any event, if you take the sum of all of them, they should balance out to zero perfectly. And so the positive will cancel with the negative. If this is true, uh, then that is a lot more confidence that your answer is correct. Now, it doesn't mean that it's correct, but you probably did a good job, right? So yeah, let's continue on to the original video. Thank you. Let's do an example here. So let's say we have a very simple system. This is very simple to uh, so much of the other ones. We have a battery, we have a resistor, we have voltage and current. And the question is, what is the power absorbed by the resistor? What is the power absorbed by the battery? We better get the same number right? We better get uh, whatever watts, but this will be a positive number and this will be a negative number, right? Okay, so let's do, let's solve this and we can see if we apply KVL, we can see that we're going to get negative 12 volts. So if we, we can, we can do the proper KVL minus 12 minus V, we're back to here equals zero. So V equals, in this case, negative 12 volts, good. And then we can apply Ohm's law, right? So Ohm's law would say V equals, so this I is going to the negative terminal, V equals minus IR, good. And so then we have, we want to solve for this I, so I equals minus V over R equals minus negative 12 over 5, and it's positive 2.4 amps. With this, we can use our power equation. We see I is going into the negative terminal. Again, the power equation should be negative, so P equals minus I V for the resistor. So, we can just plug in our numbers, uh, minus 2.4, and then we gotta put the minus 12, so P is positive 28.8 watts. Excellent, we're getting a positive number for the resistor, right? We better get negative 28.8 watts for the battery, so let's do the same thing. So this current, uh, all uh, um, elements share the same value of current that are in series, and all these elements are in series, so this current's going through and hitting this negative terminal. So that means we are using the negative version of power again. And so uh, P equals minus IV, and then we can now plug in all the values. So we have 2.4 here, but in this case, the V that we're gonna plug in is not the V here. We gotta be careful. It's this battery V, 
right? And that's a positive 12 volts. So don't mess that up, right? Um, and so we get negative 28.8 watts. And I really want to hit that home. It's very easy to mess it up because when you wrote this equation, P equals IV, P equals IV, uh, you got to be careful. What I and what V are you talking about? The general equation for P equals IV, yeah, it just has an I and V. But when you use this equation right for this one, you're only looking at this localized world. When you're looking at this equation, you're looking at this localized world. So be very careful when applying these equations. Don't just grab any voltage and any current just because it seems to fit. You have to recognize which world, which little local part is this dealing with, right? Um, a lot of students make this mistake. Same with Ohm's law, right? V equals plus or minus IR. Which I, which R, right? Which V, okay? So don't make those mistakes, okay? All right, excellent. Now let's look at some, these are some power equations for a resistor, right? And what's nice about these is it just speeds you up a little bit, right? Again, this equation always works for any element. P equals plus or minus IV always works. But if you are dealing with a resistor, then you have two more equations in your tool belt that are special cases of this, all right? So the two equations are P equals I squared R and P equals V squared over R. And the nice thing about these equations is that if I don't know the voltage, but I do know the current and resistance, I think can still calculate the power. Same thing for this one. If I don't know the current, but I know the voltage and resistance, I can still calculate the power for a resistor. That just makes it a lot faster by knowing these two equations. But they are derived, these two are derived from this one plus Ohm's law. So the combination of Ohm's law and this gives you these two equations. Notice the pattern too. They both have a square in it, right? They both have a square in it. Um, but notice this one has the R in the top and this one has the R in the bottom, right? And so what is this telling you physically? This is telling you that the more you, you pump up the current, the power increases by the square, right? The power, and where does that power go? It burns off as heat, right? Okay, so same with this. So you gotta be careful. So these are called I squared. So you've heard, you'll hear in the field I squared R losses, right? That's what this means. Okay, so let's just, you know, this is, this is just to show you where it comes from. I know it's a proof, right? The intention is not to bore you with the details, but to kind of satisfy curiosity. It's like, where does these come from? Let's just do a simple case. I have a resistor, I have a voltage, I have a current, I have an R, right? I know my power equation always works in this case, P equals plus IV. And I know Ohm's law will work. V in this case will be plus IR. And notice I can take this V and plug it right in and I get I times uh, IR, which would leave me this one, or I can solve for I, I equals V over R and plug it in. I get V times V over R and I get that one. So you can see I get either one, either I times IR and I squared R or V times V over R and I get V squared over R. The other important thing to note about a square is does it matter which way the current is flowing in the resistor, whether it's top to bottom or bottom to top? Would it change the sign of the power? No, a negative number here would give you a positive value for the power. Same with a negative or positive number for V. The square kills it, and so you're always left with a positive number for the power, right? And that helps uh, hit home that the power you should calculate, the power absorbed that you should calculate for a resistor is always positive, okay? All right. The last thing I wanna bring up is in dependent current and voltage sources, okay? Dependent current and voltage sources. And uh, these are gonna be slightly different, well, not slightly, a little, <laughs> a little more than slightly different than the, um, independent ones. The symbol looks like a diamond instead of a, a circle. Now we are going to deal with four flavors and you can see why there's going to be, um, they are dependent because there's a, what do you call it? They're controlled by another signal, right? Another current or voltage. Um, and then they are either a current or voltage source. So there's four combinations, right? So you can either have uh, a current controlled current source, a current a voltage controlled current source, um, 
a current control voltage source or a voltage controlled voltage source, okay? And so let's look at the equations here. So can you see here that this IX is kind of the independent part? This IX is the current control. That's this first part. Here, this VX is the voltage control. IX is the current control and VX is the voltage control. Okay, so this first little letter here on this equation is the source, or sorry, is, is the control. The, the outer part, this arrow or this polarity is going to be whether it's a current or voltage source. So you can see these two are current sources, boom, boom, and these two are voltage sources, okay? Um, and so what is going on? So what you need to look for, if you see one of these, and I know this seems a little bit confusing, you need to find this IX somewhere else in the circuit, right? A here is just a number like 3, 7, 8, 11, 2.5, right? But you must find IX or VX somewhere else in the circuit diagram. And this is definitely going to be useful when we study transistors and ET370 in the next semester, right? But it's a way to simplify the, a, a dependency into one circuit. And so let's do a very simple, simple example just to hit this idea home. So we have an example here. We have um, 24 volts. Uh, a 5 ohm resistor and a, well let's, well, let's double check. What is this? Well, I see the plus or minus, so I know it's a voltage source, not a current source. And what is it dependent on? It's depending on a current, so it must be a current controlled voltage source. So that must be like this one. Yes, a current controlled voltage source. Yay. Okay. Um, a current controlled voltage source, maybe you're like, well, what's the physical intuition? What does that mean, a current controlled voltage source? Well, it means some current somewhere else in the circuit is making this voltage change. So in this case, more current here, more voltage there. Well, what's another example? Maybe a voltage control voltage source. Well, maybe you have some potentiometer knob that you can change, which changes the voltage. And then the voltage supply of something else changes. So you might have a voltage controlled voltage source, right? So this is just a way to model it in a, way, a more compact uh, method. All right. But how do we analyze it? Let's check it out. So in this case, we have the A, three volts per amps. Yep. We have five ohms, we have V. And the question is, what is this IX for this steady state system, right? It looks like we don't know what V is. It looks like we do know what A is, we don't know what VD is, but we do know that this is 24 volts and this is five. Hmm. How could we go, what tools could we use to solve for this IX, right? We, we can see there's a big loop, so we can start using some voltage uh, laws, KVL, right? Uh, we see we have Ohm's law here, right? We could put this together, right? And so let's do the KVL. And so minus 24 plus V plus VD equals zero, right? Now we know by the uh, current controlled voltage source that this VD is the same as AIX, right? By the current controlled voltage source. So if you were to write this on a midterm, I would want you to put this in here, KVL, boom, right? What else do we have? Well, we have Ohm's law. So Ohm's law V equals, I think the positive version because it's going to the positive terminal. So that's gonna go here. So Ohm's law V equals positive IX times five. And then that can get substituted in there. And notice once we do that, we're gonna get one equation, one unknown, minus 24 plus IX times five plus three times IX equals zero, right? That's written here. And then being, we're nearly done. We just solve for IX, one equation, one unknown, and we get three amps, right? And so that means three amps is flowing positively from left to right in this direction. That's it. Not too bad. So we, what have we covered? We've covered a bunch of Ohm's law examples, independent and dependent current and voltage supplies, all this stuff, and power, passive sign convention, a lot of stuff. Um, if at any point this was confusing, please rewind and go and go back and, and, and uh, hopefully it'll become more clear. Okay, I'll see you guys in class. Have a great day.